In this video, I'm going to be talking about dealing narcotic drugs in Indiana and what to do if you've been charged with dealing. In a lot of cases, a person may just be a user of drugs and actually just in possession of narcotic drugs, but based on the circumstances surrounding the arrest, the prosecutors decide to charge them with dealing, which involves a lot more serious consequences. If you or a loved one have been charged with this offense, you may be wondering what you should be doing to help their situation. This video will help answer that question. So the first thing we should do is talk about what is a narcotic drug. It is a type of controlled substance, but it's narrower than the controlled substance definition. It's a substance that's regulated by the controlled substance statutes here in Indiana, but it's more specific, and what it includes are opiate drugs such as heroin, fentanyl, methadone, oxycodone, and other narcotic pain relievers. When we look at the narcotic drug dealing statute, it's Indiana Code 35-48-401. It says that a person who knowingly intentionally delivers or finances delivery of a narcotic drug, or even possesses with the intent to deliver or finance the delivery of a narcotic drug, commits the offense of dealing a narcotic drug, which is a level 5 felony at its lowest. But it's important to know though, like most drug offenses in Indiana, is that the penalty can increase based on the amount of drug that's possessed by the person. So for instance, if you're caught dealing over 10 grams, it would be a level two felony, and at the lowest, under one gram, it's a level five felony. It's also important to know that there's things that are known as enhancing circumstances that elevate the level of the crime. And here's a list of what these enhancing circumstances are. It can be found in 3548.1-16.5. And essentially it says that there's different things that can enhance a drug offense for instance, committing the offense while in possession of a firearm, committing the offense around children, things like that can enhance the penalty, which if you're caught with a lower amount of the drug, for instance, if you're caught with one to five grams with an enhancing circumstance, you're then charged at a higher level at a level three. So that's how that works. So it's important to note whether or not there's enhancing circumstances charged in your case. The penalties for possession of a narcotic drug are also varied. At the low end with level five, it's one to six years imprisonment with an advisory of three years. And at the high end, it's 10 to 30 years with an advisory of 17.5 years. So at the high end, you can see as a level two felony, the penalty is extremely serious. So if you've been charged, there's a few documents you should review at the start of your case. First, there's the charging information. This is the document that state files that lays out the statutes that you're charged under. And it's a brief summary of the facts that the state would need to prove to show that you committed the alleged offense. The second thing you want to look at is the probable cause affidavit. It's a longer summary or narrative that talks about what happened in the alleged offense and typically it's sworn by the arresting officer and submitted by the prosecutor. And the third thing is the discovery. You want to see the discovery in your case. You may not have it at the beginning, but within the first couple of months of your case, you want to be asking, where's the discovery? What's the evidence they have against me? And you want to start looking into those things. So here is an example of a charging information. Here you can see count one state alleged that on or about a certain date, this person did knowingly or intentionally possess with the intent to deliver fentanyl, pure or adulterated, which is a narcotic drug classified in Schedule 2 and in a weight of at least 10 grams. So here they're charging that the person had the narcotic fentanyl in an amount over 10 grams, which uh, pursuant to the chart we showed earlier is a level 2 felony, which that person could then be facing potentially 10 to 30 years imprisonment. And you can see just count two, this is different. They're charging the person allegedly had cocaine as well, so they're charging them as well for a level two under the cocaine statute. So what do you do if you've been charged? That's the next thing we're gonna talk about is we're gonna talk about how you can go about defending a drug dealing case. And one of the first things to talk about is that you can be charged with dealing based on an inference on that second part of the statute where it says that possession with the intent to finance or deliver. So possession alone, if there's certain things around the possession that could lead a prosecutor or a police officer to believe that this person was committing dealing as well as just possession, you may get charged with dealing. So the things they look at is if you have a large quantity of drugs, typically dealers possess a large quantity of drugs. They would look at how it's packaged. For instance, are there a lot of little baggies? Are there corners cut off the baggies? That could infer drug dealing. A lot of times they would look to see if they were arrested with a large amount of cash, if there was a large amount of cash. The state may believe that the person was dealing. They would also look at were there multiple cell phones or even guns. Those are the factors that the state would look to, and there's even more, that you're going to see if you just have a possession case, what are they doing to show that you're dealing? There's also a few common fact patterns you see in a drug dealing case. And the first is a Terry stop. A Terry stop is where an officer stops you because they have reasonable suspicion to believe that you are engaging in criminal activity. 
It can be in your car, if you're stopped, or even if you're walking, an officer may just go up to your window or stop you and engage in questions that examine more about what's happening. That's known as a Terry stop. So you're gonna see first, why did the officer stop you? Was there actually reasonable suspicion of criminal activity? Was that belief reasonable? Did they have a right to infringe on your freedom of walking down the street or sitting parked in your car? You're gonna to wanna to question that. The second thing you're gonna to wanna to look at is how did a stop lead to a search. So you're going to want to see if the search was reasonable and appropriate under the Indiana Constitution. And then you're also going to see, did the officer say they saw a hand-to-hand -hand exchange? So it's in the first part of the statute where they're saying they saw a person, they saw the delivery, or are they talking more about dealing based on inference? And you're going to see, can you challenge how dealing is inferred from the circumstances? The second common fact pattern is a traffic stop. And like a Terry stop, you're first going to look at the stop. Can you challenge a stop? Did the officer have a real reason to pull you over? So was there an infraction being committed? Or if there wasn't a real reason, you could potentially have a suppression issue where you were illegally stopped and you could then move to suppress the evidence, which means that your Fourth Amendment rights were violated and that any evidence obtained in the stop shouldn't be used against you. So first you want to see, can you challenge a stop? Second, you're going to want to look at how did the stop lead to a search? The officer just doesn't have a right to go and pull you over and search your car. So are they saying that they smelled something? Did they see something visibly? Or is there a canine involved and the canine went around your car and indicated to the officer that there may be drugs present and then that led to the search. So even if a canine's involved, there's things you're going to want to look into, such as did the officers respond with the canine quickly and in a reasonable time period. And then third, even you're going to look at how it's dealing inferred from the circumstances. Is it just a possession and there's things around the possession to show dealing? You're going to look at that. The third common fact pattern is a controlled buy. So a controlled buy is where officers work with the confidential informant to set up a controlled purchase of drugs. Here the officers do as much as possible to control the environment. So they're not only relying on just the confidential informant's testimony, they all rely on the money that was exchanged. They're gonna try and get video or audio of what happened. And then they're gonna even control the pick up and drop off to show as much as possible that this is a reliable confidential informant. But relying on a confidential informant's testimony alone can be problematic. A lot of times this person may have bargained in one of their own cases in exchange for favorable treatment to do this purchase. They also may have criminal history that could show that they have a propensity for lying. And there could just be issues in general with the confidential informant. So you're going to want to look into those and explore those with your attorney to see if you can attack the confidential informant's credibility. So those are three common fact patterns you would see in a drug dealing case and ways to challenge it. There's also other challenges that you can do. For instance, you can challenge the weight, the weight of the drugs. Maybe there's an issue with how the drugs were weighed, that maybe the bag was hanging over the scale, or you have it tested by a third party and it comes out to be a different weight. You also want to look at, can the state prove the enhancing circumstance? For instance, if there was a gun, can they prove that you were knowingly in possession of the gun? Or can they prove there were children around? And there's also knowledge and intent issues. Can the state prove that you knew the drugs were there? A person can be caught in a vehicle with a large amount of drugs and actually not know they're there. They have to prove that there was that knowledge and intent. So those are some common ways you can challenge a narcotic dealing charge in Indiana. If you have more questions, you should give my office a call or text me. What we do is pull your probable cause information, review the facts in your case, and talk to you specifically about what we would recommend in your situation. So again, my name is Nathan Vining. Give me a call or text me and I'd be happy to talk with you about what's going on.